um, get this, I just uh, noticed the synchronicity today. So we just did our podcast every week. We do a We the People podcast on constitutional issues in the news, uh, bringing together experts from both sides. The case was argued by my brother-in-law, Neil Katyal. And of course, it was the first constitutional case that Justice Amy Coney Barrett uh, considered. And on the Interactive Constitution, the National Constitution Center's amazing free online platform, if you go to the powers denied Congress, you will find, if we can find the, the suspension clause, which I may have to uh, look for for just a moment, um, you'll find that Justice Barrett and Neil uh, wrote their common explainer. So let's see how good the search function is. If I look fast, I find, I'm just illustrating this as an example of how incredible the experts on this amazing tool are. And each provision, here it is, um, has a thousand words from our liberal and conservative experts about what they agree the provision means. So here's Amy Coney Barrett, who was then a circuit uh, judge just two years ago when we commissioned this, and Neil Katyal, who argued the case with a thousand words on what they agree the suspension clause means. So the suspension clause could be relevant in the news if the president tried to suspend uh, habeas corpus without congressional approval. And what's so exciting about these provisions is that every word in them is agreed to by the leading liberal and conservative experts in America. You can be completely confident that uh, every word is, if, if them is true as the old uh, jingle goes, and you can teach them without any fear of partisanship. Now let's go to the issues that are before the courts uh, right now. Now, just to give you a sense of the state of play, I'm trying to follow this as all of you are as well. If um, Vice President Biden gets an electoral college majority without Pennsylvania, which according to the Wall Street Journal and Fox News and all sorts of uh, non uh, sources of all perspectives is a possibility by tomorrow, then um, this is unlikely to get to the US Supreme Court because the US Supreme Court will not feel compelled to intervene unless the election is at stake and it believes that a constitutional violation could change the results of the election. But let's imagine uh, uh, the possibility, which remains real until it isn't. If we were teaching the election clause today, we could say, um, here's what's going on in Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ordered ballots to be counted if they arrived uh, until November uh, seventh, three days after the election, as long as they were postmarked by election day. And uh, Republicans sued to stop those ballots from being counted. And the court split four to four on the question of whether or not that suit should be considered by the court, which allowed the lower court's ruling to go into effect. Justice Samuel Alito wrote a really important concurring opinion where he said that the legislature of the state has the authority to set election rules according to Article uh, 1, Section 4 of the Constitution and Article 2 of the Constitution. And any attempt by any court, state or federal, to change the rules might violate the, elect the state legislature's prerogatives. Okay, now it took me a while to sum that up. Now let's go to the interactive Constitution. And it is just so remarkably interesting that if we go to Article 1, Section 4, the election clause, we have two great experts, Michael Morley and Fernita Tolson have been rocking it on our podcast and programs. Michael Morley is a uh, conservative. Fernita Tolson is a progressive scholar. Um, Fernita and Ned Foley have a um, podcast called uh, Foley and uh, Fernita where they talk about election issues. And we've had great programs on contested elections throughout history with both of them. But what's so interesting about this is that Michael, in his very prescient concurring opinion, because each bit of the interactive constitution has a common statement and then a separate statement where the scholars talk about the areas of disagreement, flags Justice Alito's theory. And I know I'm kind of in the weeds here, but I know you're following along with me. He basically, two years before the US Supreme Court began to really press this theory, which was just flicked at in Bush v. Gore, but has become now very enthusiastically embraced by Justices Alito, Kavanaugh, Thomas and Gorsuch, Michael Morley said, and let's read what he said here. Um, 
the framers of the Constitution sought to preserve the fairness of congressional elections by allowing state legislatures and ultimately Congress to regulate them. A majority of the modern Supreme Court, however, does not trust institutional state legislatures to oversee the electoral process. Both legislatures and Congress are composed of partisan elected representatives who might be tempted to tweak the rules to aid their political allies rather than promoting the public interest. Thus, in the Arizona State Legislature versus Arizona Independent Redistricting Commission case by a bare five to four majority, the court decided to ignore the plain meaning of the election clause and held that legislature doesn't mean what most people would assume. It doesn't refer to the legislature, but refers to any lawmaking process. These holdings are flatly wrong, directly contradicted the plain meaning of the election clause and should be overturned. So this is very significant because it's the core of the argument that the conservative justices are now embracing to basically read a parallel um, delegation of power to the state legislatures in Article 2 uh, to be exclusive and to call for the overturning of this Arizona case, which should have huge implications. All right, I know I've, uh, I've gone on too long and I'm uh, showing you my excitement about how prescient this provision was. But what I'm trying to convey to you, friends, is that I just so firmly believe, and Curry and I experience every time we teach these questions, we can teach the most contested questions that are uh, in American politics and that are in front of the courts from uh, the nature of the Electoral College to Roe v. Wade to uh, the Second Amendment gun rights. But what we've got to do is teach students to separate their political from their constitutional views, asking not what the government should do, but what the constitution allows or forbids it to do. This is a lawyer's move. I'm a law professor. This is what I tell my students when I teach constitutional law. What the Constitution Center is trying to do and what I would love all of you to do, teachers and colleagues, is to help us bring this tool of constitutional reasoning to students starting in middle school. And it may seem like a radical act of faith to ask middle school students to read Supreme Court opinions. I, last year when we launched these live classes, said, I want you to remember to read the majority opinions as well as the dissent. And one student uh, put in the chat box, I'm Oliver, you know, I'm in eighth grade. I'm not sure I can read the dissents. We said, Oliver, we know you can, and he did. And people will rise to the challenge. So that's where we're at. And now that we just see this week so powerfully how divided this country is, more divided than any time since the Civil War, it is so urgently important to really uh, cleave to these constitutional structures, which are the only thing that binds us, that keeps us together, to be unapologetically rigorous about talking about the areas of agreement and disagreement before the Supreme Court, and to use this great tool, the interactive constitution that I've only shown you uh, the essay part of it. I've left out the podcasts, uh, media libraries, the unbelievable uh, current events provisions that relate to every single clause, uh, which are so exciting and a great way to bring the constitution into the classroom, as well as these educational videos, which are the archived versions of the classes that Curry and I are teaching three times a week with our colleagues. So that's where we're at. Would love to take uh, Curry's questions and, and teacher friends who are watching. This is also a our, our, our call to action is please join us. If you're not already signing up for our classes or joining our teacher advisory board, please do because we would love you to be part of this great mission we have of offering free online learning about the constitution to your students and uh, would so love your help and advice. And thank you so much for listening. And Curry, what do you think? Um, I think you did great, um, as always. <laughs> I think we, you know, there's a lot going on with the election, and we wanted to ensure that we started off with what it, what is the debate and what is the contested pieces right now, and because that's going to be the hardest question to kind of handle in the classroom on the constitutional level as we go through. Um, Jeff, real quickly, and then I want to turn it to the rest of the panel because I know we've all been teaching about the foundation as well and looking at the electoral college and voting rights. Um, so do you wanna show them really quickly kind of where in the classroom or other spots we have those two pieces and then from Darcy and Christopher and, um, and Emma and David, I'd love to hear kind of all the pieces you all have around the electoral college and voting rights as well. That's wonderful, I'll just tee it up and then we'll, um get out of your way. So the two provisions that are really relevant are uh, Article 2 is the executive branch. Section 1 sets out the, in this, in this uh, third clause, uh, first sentence, executive power vested in the president, the vesting clause, and he holds the term for four years. 
Um, the third is that each state shall appoint in a manner as the legislature thereof may direct. That's what that word that puts all the emphasis on the legislature, a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives. We have our uh, essay by our scholars. And then in addition, there's the 12th amendment, which was passed after the election of 1800, uh, when the tie in the house almost led to the election of Aaron Burr. And the 12th amendment makes clear that political parties were a part of the system by this point, ensures that you can't have a tie between the president and vice president anymore, and was cited by the US Supreme Court last June when they unanimously said that states have the power to punish faithless electors because whatever the original meaning of the ele uh, electoral college was, it was changed by the 12th amendment. So it's now a mean to carry out the party's will rather than to have electors exercise independent judgments. So that is what we got on the interactive constitution. Thank you so much friends and take it away. Thank you, uh, Jeff, that was awesome. And I just, we were talking today about the Bill of Rights and the Constitution. And what I love about the interactive Constitution is it really reminds us as Madison said about the Bill of Rights, it's, it's our values of our people wrapped together in this doctrine of rights. And then Sal Khan spoke of it's, it's our civic religion. So that's what I love about starting with the Constitution. We start with these values that we see as something at the table that we can talk about, we can understand, and we can say, what does the Constitution say? And then have those dialogues. So Kelly Self wrote in the chat, I just have to figure out how to have Thanksgiving dinner with my family. We say start with the interactive Constitution. True, it's a great Thanksgiving treat. <laughs> <laughs> At least for our nerdy families, we, we bring it on. Um, but I think that's a great way to tee up. But I'd love to hear um, from Christopher and Darcy, Emma and David, kind of what are your great pieces around teaching about the election, the Electoral College and voting rights. So let's kick it over. Let's start with Emma. Emma, do you want to go first? I know iCivics has a ton of awesome stuff. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I just want to give a shout out to that excellent point about even during the most contentious elections, during the most fraught times, we can always lean into the Constitution. I've heard lots of stories. I know all of you are experiencing this, right? You know, I, I'm not sure I want to teach the election or worse, my administration is telling me not to teach the election. Well, I'm certain no one's telling you not to teach the Constitution. And so you can lean right into that. You can use the interactive Constitution and, and other resources and say, I, I'm I'm teaching the Constitution. Yeah, we might dabble in the election. So be it. You can't you can't touch the Constitution without doing that. With that, I'd love to draw your attention just to a couple of really great iCivics resources for this particular uh, reason or for this particular topic. Obviously, our very popular game, Win the White House, is just a great way to expose students to the Electoral College to help them understand it. It's funny. We were watching the numbers and they were sky high yesterday. So many folks, so many students playing Win the White House. What was neat was to see those numbers jump up again today, because it's one thing to sort of understand it in the lead up. It's another thing to look at what happened last night and is still going on today and saying what's happening and to play this game to make sense of it. I'll mention one other resource that's been really popular this uh, electoral season, which is our popular V President lesson plan. This lesson plan is chock full of everything you need to know about the Electoral College. And with the help of someone who's here tonight, a teacher here tonight, uh, we were able to put it into Google Slides and make it compatible with Pear Deck. And so if you're teaching virtually, you can use this lesson plan in that way. Awesome. Uh, there were so many good things I was waiting because I know iCivics has the great infographics as well. So I'm just really in love with all of your stuff. Um, now, Darcy, the work of Generation Citizen is unbelievable in this field. And I always feel like this is where the kids get to really be boots on the ground and work and be a part of the system and see it in every single angle. So I'd love to hear about Generation Citizen's work with the election, with voting um, and the electoral college as well. And you are muted. <clears throat> Absolutely. So the, um, the first thing I will say is um, I agree with everything Emma is saying that a lot of times um, everything that we're navigating right now brings up a lot of emotion. And one way to get us to the fundamentals or to the kind of core of the issues are to talk about the constitution and talk about the fundamentals of democracy. And with young people, when they're feeling a lot of emotions, that's also a really helpful way to ground them, to talk to them about what are the concrete laws that we know of? What are the fundamentals of democracy? 
one thing we are promoting talking about is what does transfer of power look like? What can happen? What can't happen? Um, despite any words that you're hearing. Um, and so I, I appreciate Emma, you kind of starting us off with that. Um, two resources that we are really promoting are one is our go beyond the ballot website. Um, it's go beyond the ballot.com. And that has a lot of resources around how to teach the election. And the other is um, a post election resource that I just put in the chat. Um, and this, this resource was supported or developed by one of our staff members to both talk about what are the fu election fundamentals and also what are the um, emotional ways we can support young people at this time. And so that's one of the things that we really want to support is the social and emotional development of our young people, how they're grappling with what they're seeing happen and how they feel about it, but also the, the kind of mental stability around all of this. Um, and so we're promoting both of these, these resources that are helpful. Um, and the other thing that I will say that we really promote at Generation Citizen is to help young people look towards the policies that are connected to the issues that are kind of spotlighted in their mind. So at this time where they're seeing everything happen with the, with the election and there's questions around um, the states and, and mail-in ballots, helping them kind of ground them in what are the issues that are still important to you? And what are, who are the senators that have been elected right now? And where do they stand on the issues? Do, they, do you agree with where they stand? And if not, what can you do? And that's a place where it really helps young people take action and see that they can make change and their voice is important. Um, and that's a really helpful way of, of, again, taking the emotion and focusing it at this time. And Darcy, I think that's what I love best about Generation Citizen because it doesn't turn into, I'm just teaching an election class leading up to the election, that it rolls right into, now let's see what policies are affecting you going to school, going you know to college, all these pieces. So it, it really is what we want our students to do is embrace the process yes. every single day and not just every four years. So I love that work that you're doing. Yeah. Now, Christopher, it's gonna be hard for you. You have to follow these two. <laughs> No, it's, you know, it's one of the things I'm so excited about, actually, is that I'd be thrilled, I'm thrilled to follow them because Emma hit the nail on the head, Darcy, you hit the nail on the head. I think one of the things I'm so proud of right now is that I think this field can see we're all here, right? The major organizations, we're here and we're talking about this because we know how important this is because we're seeing it day in and day out, right, all together. And we're seeing it in the diversity of ways that we approach this question. You know, right before this, I was lecturing to adults and it reminded me that the reality of what makes our space different and what makes me so proud of everybody on this Zoom call is that unlike math and unlike science is that our students, whether they are in middle school and elementary school, high school or adults or in college or even my law students, they come into the classroom experiencing the civic and constitutional education every day. That's the only field of study that this exists every day the people that we are all trying to serve are experiencing what we are teaching because that's the nature of this field. So I'm particularly pr proud, I know from the uh, center's perspective of the 60 second civic work that we did and are continuing to do around the election and voting and such as a resource. I know there's a lot of members of the public that have actually been using it, which I've been very proud of. But I actually come back to one thing that was just said that I think is so um, important, which is that you know, in many, many ways, um, one of the things I've been emphasizing when I talk to people is, you know, whether my constitutional professor hat is on or not, um, at the same time as we're talking about the national constitution, this is a local event in so many ways. And this is something that is very much controlled by a secretary of state or a particular registrar of, of whatever in a particular state. People forget the importance of the local aspect of elections. And students, I think have, I've noticed, sometimes have a, a hard time wrapping their mind around, this person I've never heard of is counting my ballots in a particular way, or is counting ballots, maybe not my ballots in a particular way. Why? How does that make any sense? Why have I never heard of this person before? How do I interact with that person? That's, I think, one of the shocking pieces of federalism that I always come back to, that is both exciting but really hard sometimes to teach because it's a little easier to point to a president or a senator, as Darcy said, the brilliant. It's a little harder to point to a court clerk 
and say that this person controls this aspect of a particular electoral process. It's why one of the things I always try to emphasize, no matter who I'm speaking to, is the importance of local elections and the importance of state elections. That matters so much, so much more in so many ways, oftentimes than federal elections, not always, but very often. I'm so excited you brought up federalism. It is one of my favorite topics. And so this is what I love about this is like all of us are teaching classes and materials and we've been teaching online classes and we started with federalism and then we rolled into elections and voting rights. These are all connected. And as we teach about this all being a web that we're working through and working in, it's a much more understandable system for kids to be able to understand and jump in. So David, the Bill of Rights Institute does such amazing work, really just helping our students and our teachers get prepared to understand the election and do the work for the, the understanding it as well as engaging in it. So can you share kind of the ways that you've been working on this? Sure, and wonderful to be with everyone and uh, proud of the fact that we were able to make a statement with uh, the organizations represented on this call about the importance of free, fair elections and the transfer of power. One of the things that struck me looking at the, the great chat that's happening and, and uh, comments like, how do, how do we teach when a person or entire political party doesn't follow the concrete laws that we have? I think it's important to go to those kind of uh, questions, even though it, it can seem like it, it, it might open up a hornet's nest. Because in the airing of those things, we talked about the social and emotional learning, there's a way to channel that energy and allow that kind of hearing from students. How is polarization and hyperpartisanship affect a 17 year old? I was struck by a conversation that I had with a student recently where they said, I just wonder, can I disagree with my friends and still be friends with them? That's a profound question. And I think what we wanna do is, is in all of the talk about institutions and ideas and, and the wonderful things that we celebrate and, and certainly can and should wonk out about, let's not lose sight of that human element that's at the heart of this. And that, that this thing is affecting these young people in ways that, that they're not always able to even articulate. What we've tried to do with three resources, and I'll drop them into the, uh, the chat here, is um, really uh, highlight some of those questions. Uh, we just released a video with a person who has been long involved in thinking about elections uh, for the American Enterprise Institute, John Fortier did an interesting book on the Electoral College with new chapters added on national popular vote. Uh, John did an hour long Q&A with the BRI Teacher Council and that video is available on YouTube now. Uh, we also have a, a, a video on the Electoral College that makes for a good four and a half minute explainer say at the top of a, a class. Uh, one uh, young person's comments in the, in the uh, section, uh, I think spoke to what, what we tried to accomplish with this is, we're not looking for just um, uh, uh, kind of uh, criticizing the electoral college or celebrating it, just saying, what is it? Because this is a mystical, you know, kind of strange uh, institution for, for 16 year olds and for a lot of adults as well. So the what is it part of it is, 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 uh, is a lot of the battle here. The final thing is we have an e-lesson. Uh, some of you may receive the BRI e-lessons in your inbox. Uh, one recent one was on contentious elections and the peaceful transition of power. We'll make sure you get the link in the chat on, uh, on, on, on that as well. And just to let everybody know as we go through this, we as a group have collected all these resources that we thought would be helpful for you. So at the end of the program, we're gonna send, we can send you the chat, but we can also send you that full list of resources and share it to everybody. So you don't have to panic and take notes. We're really trying to make sure we, you have a lot to do during the day. We can at least make you a resource list. Um, so all the questions that we're asking right now and throughout the program are coming from the registration of the teachers in this program and then also from the chat box. So if you have more, feel free to do that. You guys just did an awesome job kind of teeing up the first five questions. So I absolutely love it. But I wanted to dive in a little bit deeper in one. Um, and at the end, I can share some of the NCC resources. But we touched upon it, but I think we need to spend more time on it. So when students display completely opposite values in your class. How do you find common ground? And then there's a kind of a secondary question in here that was very similar. How is civil discourse, civil discourse is more and more important to teach our students 
what are some of the tools around that? So I think that's a huge thing sometimes. And one of our teachers put this in the, in the registration question, my kids are not different. How do I, how do I infiltrate different ideas in there? So they hear different perspectives, but still when you have students that are polar opposites at times, students may not be able to find their voice if they feel isolated, that they're the only ones that think that way. So I want to ask each of our panelists today, say, what are some of the ways that you can embrace civic discourse in your community groups, in your classrooms, in your, at your Thanksgiving table, at your dinner table, but also what are the tools that you can use to ensure that student voice is heard even when they feel that they are one of the few. So let's jump around a little. Christopher, let's go to you first. That is such a wonderful question. And I you know, emphasize what David said too, because it's really important to protect the space to speak. You know, One thing that I often will say when I have a class and I have high school students through graduate students at Columbia is if we can't talk in a constitutional law class about contentious topics, there is no other place where we can talk about this. I mean, we have to embrace the diversity of ideas that come from so many different people. But that's not always easy because a lot of discussion that we have in the constitution is really difficult. The constitution has changed significantly over time. And I know I have probably been fortunate to always try to foster safe, respectful dialogue, but also contentious dialogue. Columbia, you know, students come from all over the place uh, here in New York and a lot of them have very different ideas about the way in which things should look. And, and I think it's important to foster that space, but I know that you are always kind of watching the guardrails and it's important to be very careful to watch the guardrails and make sure as the, as the, you know, as the center and the teacher that you are ensuring that you maintain and watch those guardrails. It's not always easy. Um, I found that I've actually been surprised over these past 10 years probably that the topics I thought would be far more contentious ended up not being as contentious. Some that I never expected would be contentious were way off the charts. I see Emma smiling because I am thinking the same Darcy too. Yeah, I know. And I was just, sometimes I've sat there and just said, this is what everyone's worried about. This is very strange, but it's not easy to be the person that constantly brings things together, but then also will foment a healthy discussion. I've always started all of my courses off by saying, this is a safe, we have to be able to talk about these things in this class if we're gonna talk about them anywhere. I'm always very conscious to watch the students as they're interacting and having these discussions. And I think it's important that we give them the tools to make decisions, protect different opinions, like First Amendment concepts, but still allow for those differences of opinion. Because again, they're going to come into our classroom and one of their fellow students or somebody they know or themselves has just had a constitution or civic interaction, something that has affected them personally often. And I try to unpack that and try to look through that because that's what they're thinking about at the time. And it's not always to the lesson plan. It certainly is not always to the syllabus. Great, that's awesome. Um, Dar Darcy, would you like to go next and kind of jump in on this one? Yeah, I'll add a couple, a couple thoughts that come to mind. I think the first thing is this is very relevant. Right now, we, you know, there is a, a, a communication and promotion around patriotic education and patriotic initiative. And that means that some of our work around equity might not be very welcome at this time. Um, and so the conversations that are promoted in the classroom can seem where in the past, they may have seemed kind of like student voice conversations, they can seem very controversial. And so one of the one of the strategies I think we need to do to elevate student voice, but also allow a lot of other voices to be included in the classroom is to proactively communicate some of the topics that may be discussed in the classroom to families and then actually bring families into the conversation. So one thing I did when I was a principal was I had family panel discussions and saying, here's the core topic. We are actively looking for people who believe a lot of different things about this topic, you know, front load it by talking to them so you know what the <laughs> what they're going to bring up in the discussion, but bringing that into the classroom and allowing um, young people to see supportive discourse. Um, and the other thing is um, making sure that your instructional practices actually support dialogue, discourse, and um, disagreement. Um, and so 
having a conversation or, or in, including in again for our organization and i think um christopher you named this we really do look at the local elections and the lo the lo what's happening on a local level but bringing in policies and actually helping young people dissect the roots behind the policy and elevate what they agree with what they disagree with having conversations around one central policy um, and then we promote it with our curriculum that we support teachers around um, consensus building so I think it's important as we talk about difference of opinion, we also help young people see that there can be a consensus. The idea of we agree to disagree um, doesn't always have to be the answer, that we can actually find a common ground that we can promote um, and then helping teachers or helping families see that's kind of one of the values that you're going to promote in your classroom and that's where we're headed. So they can be um, a little more open to some of the controversial topics, knowing that you're going to find this common ground. Super exciting. I got so excited. I was snapping and realized my mute was on, <laughs> was not on. And I was like, oh, they can hear me. <laughs> I think just think it's so important. And I'll wrap up at the end and talk about kind of the work that we're doing with civil discourse. Um, but it is, is so important to get the parents aware of what you're doing. So then you, you know, the worst thing you can have as a parent is a kid come home and say, oh, we're talking about this in class. And it might be something that you don't know or you don't feel comfortable with. And first of all, we know kids don't always deliver our messages well. So <laughs> help them out, do it for them, bring them in the, um, the field and then give the children the power to run those conversations outside the classroom with their parents. David, I'd love for you to jump in here and then Emma will jump to you next. I wonder if anyone has tried voting uh, pick the most contentious thing that your students could nominate. Uh, when we do Constitutional Academy with uh, Bill of Rights Institute, uh, students from around the country, uh, the topic has usually been abortion. Uh, ask them to vote uh, with students gathering on the side of the, the room, agree with uh, statement A, and then statement B, the, its polar opposite is on the other side of the room. Then you lay down the ground rules and say there's n there's n can be in terms of weaponizing words and you lay down those ground rules and you ask the people on the polar opposites to try to convince uh, the one to move and to move closer to them. It's an exercise in persuasion but also understanding that people have uh, differences of opinions. I did this with educators in Iraq in 2004 and it broke down and there was a moment when one educator said to the other, if we can't do this or we go it to our students. And I think that goes to a point in, uh, that was made in the chat, which is uh, right now we don't see a lot of modeling in that in, in our national office holders. What are we going to do? Well, I think you'd be surprised that many times the kids' conversation, while sometimes shaky, does not break out into a melee. And they're so pleased at the end of that because they have done something, disagreed without wanting to, you know, uh, kind of knock each other's blocks off and emerged from it stronger. And that right there is an example so that to, to, to themselves, really, we can do this. Emma, jump oh. in. You're going to pull it in. <laughs> yes, I love it. And I, it's so much fun to build upon because uh, so, you know, this idea of that Darcy brought up of discussion and dialogue and even consensus building, you know, I think we oftentimes make the mistake of setting up a discussion around a contentious issue as a debate. And I don't think that you have to do that. Um, it's natural and kids tend to think it's fun, right? Because we love sports and we love a good competition. But when you set something up as a debate, I think you're naturally making it adversarial and you're making the point to win or to beat the other side. Where when you make it more about dialogue and understanding, coming to a shared understanding, a deeper understanding, arriving at a consensus, I think you're setting the kids up for a far more civil discussion. And I love David's idea of, you know, splitting the splitting folks up across the room or doing those four corners activities. And you can start off with, you know, really easy things about your favorite kind of soda. And then instead of just splitting the kids up, take a moment and celebrate that difference. Take a moment and say, isn't this so cool that we live in a place where you can love Mountain Dew and you can love Sprite and we can still be friends. And then of course, elevate, right? I don't want to keep it. I don't want it to be trivial. I want you to elevate into those deeper real issues. And ultimately, I think what we want to cultivate in our classrooms is a commitment to 
civil disagreement, and civic friendship. This ability to fight fair, to engage in conversation with a commitment to honesty, to trustworthiness, to interpreting other views more charitably, assuming good intent. And then obviously, you know, with your, with your students, and not obviously, but ultimately I should say, with your students in the classroom and classroom community, cultivating that civic friendship, this idea that we can regard each other as fellow Americans, we might disagree on a lot of issues. We might disagree really passionately, but maybe we can agree on some higher ideals, ideals some, some bigger standards for a democratic way of life and, and focus on those, focus on those commonalities. And when you wanna dive into the divisive issues, by all means, teaching controversial issues, contentious topics is absolutely a best practice, but you don't have to set it up as a fight. So I'm going to jump in here because this is one of my favorite things to do at the Constitution Center um, is really kind of engage in that civil dialogue practice because if you're not talking about the Constitution and you're not discussing it and, de and debating it in that the real sense of the word debate Emma I'm with you on that not the battle you debate to learn not to win let's get it straight um, then you're really not doing the Constitution in my opinion at all so we have a ton of online resources around civil discourse um, one of the things that I wanted to share because Greg in the chat shared like you know we're not seeing our adults do this we're not watching our adults do this our kids are amazing at this um, we use a method um, called the Harkness method. We like to refer to it as a little bit of a butchered Harkness method. We have online videos with Justice um, Breyer speaking about how they set up the norms in the Supreme Court. So all those behaviors that you're doing in your classroom fall into this and they set this up. So what are the norms and what are the behaviors that you will have in a civil dialogue that you want to see? And then how can you work that into the question that's at the table that you can discuss and look at together as a unit through some methods like, I mean, fishbowl works really well. Um, democratic deliberation pods is another really great way to do it. But one of my favorites is Harkness. And I always feel like this is an elevated program. But just to let you know, kids go there and they go there really quickly. So at the Constitution Center, we host police trainings. We have since 2015. And one of the key things that we do in our police trainings is we have police from Philadelphia and Camden. They're, they're trained by our high school kids in Philadelphia. So our high school kids had civil discourses with each other. They had discussions around policing in a more perfect union, policing in America. And they ran those in their school. They learned the history. They learned the Constitution. They ran those as classroom leaders. And now they run them for all the police that go through the Philadelphia Police Department and the Camden Police Department. One of my favorite pictures I will have for life is my favorite picture is 80 Camden in-service police officers sitting in a giant circle at night going to the training. And there's just one of my students because they all had to get their homework done and their tests in and he's running the civil dialogue. Um, and what we've noticed with our students, training them in these materials, giving them these really hard topics to handle, hey, what is the meaning of fairness and justice? And what are those questions? I am unbelievably impressed where the way high school and middle school kids can handle this, especially the high school kids. I was having panic attacks and sweating in the corner and ready to have like, anything goes wrong, you tap me in, I'm in, and like ready to like, you know, big, big sister and like really protective of these kids. And they're like, we got this. And they did. It was unbelievable. They behaved unbelievably well. They were unbelievable leaders. And when we did research on this, we found that the police, of course, were more moved and the impact of understanding the meaning of justice and fairness in our society was deeper, deeper and richer because 15 year olds led the conversation with them on some of these hardest, most contentious issues of our time. And then we found that our students were so empowered by that. They felt like they were doing something to make their system better, to make their community better, that they started doing it in community settings themselves, in the classrooms themselves, and taking opposing opinions of other sides to be able to fight it. One of our kids that was most excited about it because he wanted to fix the police wound up running a school-wide discussion and Harkness discussion on this and absolutely defended the police the entire time because he wanted to understand where they were coming from and engage in it. And so don't worry about it. That's the thing I will say, it's scary. It's unbelievably paranoid for the, the teacher in the group to let go, but the kids 
totally have this. I don't know about the adults. You can run those later, but <laughs> the kids definitely have this. So check out our civil discourse tools online. Let us know. Some of our teachers advisory board members are on the call and they're doing this around the country um, in their communities as well. So really great and really fun ways to move on. Okay, next question for the crew. And this might be the one of the last ones that we have coming in here. Um, a real quick, I had one question directly for Darcy that I wanted to ask because I thought it was a brilliant question and it's really focused and the others feel free to chime in on this one. It's really focused on assessment tools. So the question, uh, Darcy, for you is how do I get assessment tools for civic engagement in a community setting? And I really thought that your work kind of focuses on that. And I do believe your um, title is also of impact, correct? <laughs> Ringer. <laughs> So yes, I do think a lot about assessment. Um, <laughs> I think that, um, so I'm putting a resource in the chat that actually is um, focused on civic assessment um, and with a lot of different strategies and tools around how to um, assess civic engagement. Um, but I think one of the things that we can do do best is go back to kind of the roots of our instructional practice. Um, and so we think about as, as teachers, we focus on kind of students expressing themselves through writing, students expressing themselves through dialogue, students expressing themselves through inquiry, um, and really highlighting those three elements. So with our the curriculum that we support teachers around, um, our Generation Citizen curriculum, even though we are focused on action and we don't really emphasize the assessment component of it, assessment and evaluation is constantly happening. Um, and so what you wanna do is integrate moments of dialogue and discourse, like we've been talking about, um, and use a rubric to evaluate kind of how students are sharing and if they feel open to sharing. The other piece is just allowing students to express themselves in various ways. So making sure in whatever way you're, you're engaging students around civics that they can express themselves in writing um, and persevere where writing is really challenging, express themselves through dialogue. So having, um, I think Emma, you mentioned this fishbowls where students are actually discussing and debating um, and uh, having discourse around controversial, controversial topics. Um, and expressing themselves through reflection. Um, so one of, one of the things one of my teachers um, in my grad school actually just integrated is online remote reflection. So going on Zoom and just reflecting or answering a prompt verbally, um, it allowed them to express themselves in a different way. And so I think what you wanna do is kind of go back to your teacher roots around assessment um, and evaluation. Um, and those are, those are the best tools. And then the tools that I just shared. I'm super excited about that because our teacher's advisory board is doing some research on civic engagement and civic um, dialogue and discourse on Zoom because you literally can measure the interaction points so much easier. So now I'm nerding out about that. Um, <laughs> see, we again, we all learn. So there's one final question that popped up over and over again in the chat, but also in the questions that came in. And I'd love all of you to answer it as kind of the wrap up question. And I don't mean this to sound negative. So I'm trying to reframe it in my brain as I speak. Um, one of the questions was, with the last two elections being so contentious, and even elections before that, I keep going back to Bush v. Gore and thinking about how I never want to talk about hanging chads again, um, all these pieces, what can we do to build a, it, the question was, how can we fix our democracy? But I really think the question is, how do we build a more robust democracy that we can all engage in and we can feel proud of and feel like this is working? Because right now, many Americans and many of our students feel like it's not working. And we might, some people might say like, there's parts of the constitution and the checks and balances that make the battles, the branches battle, and that's a good thing. So how do we value when the branches are doing what they're supposed to do, but it, it looks confrontational, but it's still working. And how do we see and understand what a healthy system is? So who wants to go first on that one? Chris's face looked most entertained by the question. So we'll start with Christopher. <laughs> I just love that because I, I was just talking about this today. And frankly, my answer is I won't be the first to ask my class or ask anybody I encounter. So did, you know, it, regardless of voting, what are you doing November 4th? And what are you doing November 5th? And what are you doing November 6th? Because to be a civically virtuous citizen and a civically engaged citizen or civically engaged member of society, 
has important, voting is important and serving on a jury is important, but actually what you do in your community is far more important. And if you're on a community organization, that's more important. And if you're engaged because you call and you serve on here in New York City, we have community boards. I was on one um, for a while. That's far more important. It's far more important to find a way to connect in your community and to involve yourself in your community. And it's not just about one day every two years or four years. And I try to emphasize that with the same emphasis I put earlier on local and state work because I know and I get it, everyone right now is checking their Twitter and their CNN to see what happened with the election yesterday. I get it. We are very, we, we like instant gratification. I know that. But there are so many other important elections that just happened yesterday. <laughs> there are so many districts will be redrawn based on yesterday. And nobody's really even talking about that, right? These are critical, critical points. And so I love that question just because I always try to go local, even though I'm teaching, you know, the federal constitutional law, try to get to local questions, state questions, and your day-to-day -day engagement as a member of our society. And the best part about this is that you can engage in so many different ways and pick how you want to be involved and whether it's a particular nonprofit or whether it's in a particular advocacy position. And they all serve to better bring us together in our democratic republic because you're serving and engaging in your community. So I think that's what makes it exciting. And you can see, you know, people start thinking, oh, wow, that's actually civically virtuous. That's really important. Even the fact that I just tend my community garden. I'm like, yes, yes, that matters. That's what is so important. Lead your community garden. Like that, that's what's beautiful about this. I just got very excited. Um, because I really do feel very deeply about this and because people can get excited if they know how and they realize that that it's not just about a day, it's about every day. And that's part of the American experience. Volunteering, yeah. it's the gateway drug to more engagement. <laughs> and if you have time to volunteer, like that's the other thing, if you have time and some of our students, I know I'm a big fan of paid internships because not all my kids had time to volunteer and they needed a job. So how do you work them in together? But what I, I mean, that's a positive about COVID. You're able to do it without leaving your house and having transportation as well. Um, Chris, that's awesome. And teachers, as you know, these ideas, put them in just like David Olson and everybody else into the chat and Kevin, um, redistricting. David, yes, redistricting, big thing in Pennsylvania. Um, Emma, would you like to jump in next? I would, just I love the focus on down ballot races. I love the focus on local. Yesterday, as my husband was glued to the returns in Florida, the county by county, what's going on, comparing 2016 to 2020, I was feverishly texting my friend from Jacksonville, Florida, where I used to win, used to live, because I had to know if she won her seat on the Bartram Springs Neighborhood Community Development Board. I was so invested in that race, and my friend winning that race. I mean, the most local you can imagine, the most down ballot race uh, on that ballot there in Duval County, Florida. So get students excited about that. But you know, to your larger question about what else can we do, I mean, I think the answer is more and better civic education. And I know I'm preaching to the choir. The problem with that is it's a long game. We have to invest over a long period of time and we're not going to see the results overnight. So what are some other things we can do? What a great inquiry activity. There are a lot of democratic reforms out there, a lot of ideas across the political spectrum. I think that's an excellent inquiry activity for students. How can we make the democratic fabric of our republic stronger? Come at me with your best ideas. Love it. Okay, David, what, it, what is the way that we can make our country, our, our government, our republic feel and thrive best? 500,000 election uh, elected offices, right? I mean, that's a, I'd, I'd second that. There's uh, a passage in Tocqueville where he says, if you wanna get Americans uh, activated, uh, propose uh, a road that's going to be built through their property. What does that mean for young people, right? They're not property owners, you know, but challenge them to do something practical, like talk to somebody that you, that you know you're going to disagree with on, and, and give them some ground rules. I think there were some great suggestions in the chat for how that can happen. Uh, also, I think we need to lower expectations that we're not going to come out of a polarization into uh, uh, agreement, but the constitution and our system of government is about mitigating and, and uh, managing disagreement. 
how do we disagree without being disagreeable is how one of you put it in the chat. And I think that's an okay goal. And it doesn't mean that we're just lowering our expectations or, or aiming low, but saying, look, there are steps that we need to take. What are some of those practical concrete things that we can do together? At the same time that we say, you know, the confidence and belief that people have in this system, even when you feel alienated, channel that alienation into making it better. A uh, final thought, uh, somebody just noted uh, the problem about um, action uh, civics. What we're doing here, what you just called us to action, uh, uh, Emma, uh, is, is really knowledge, skills, and a disposition. And I think that's a consensus area that, that no matter where people are and they're concerned about so-called activist civics, that we, that we can get to knowledge, skills, and disposition, and that's critical. Um, it, that is the best framework to kind of like m move pieces through. Darcy, kind of wh where is your kind of angle and your focus in the next year, the next five years, 20 years? Where are you going to go with this and building, help us build a better world? <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm so incredibly excited about this question because this is actually what brought me to Generation Citizen, the idea of action civics and the idea of young people making change and everything that we've been talking about, focusing on local elections and local policies and helping young people think to themselves, what am I passionate about? What do I care about? And what do I actually see out of my eyes in the community around me? And what can I actually change? And helping young people see that they can make change every single day. Every single teacher that teaches our curriculum is helping the cohort of young people see they can make change in their community. No, focusing on policies and saying what is actually happening and what what do the laws actually mean? How is this rel directly relevant to my life? Um, and so to your question of kind of what's next, what is in, in the future, we want to spread this across the entire country. We want young people to see civics as something they are living. Um, something we just read on our team is the Bettina Love text. Um, and one of the things that Bettina Love shares is you know, for people of color, civics is a way of life and you live a civic life. And we can help all of our young people see that the way that they live, the way they experience the world is civic action. Their passion, their commitment, whatever issues they see are relevant, all of that is civic action and that they can actually impact the things that they wanna impact. So being really concrete with them about the, what they're noticing are the policies that are impacting their world um, and helping them get to the root causes of those policies and why the policies exist the way they do. And then advocating, having them research in their community to find out what do people actually believe about these policies? What do they know about the policies and how can we actually impact the change makers or the, or the, um, the um, targets who are actually kind of putting these policies in place, um, the lawmakers, um, and just helping young people see that they can make change on a local level every single day um, is the core behind all of our work. And it's kind of what makes all of this so exciting. And, and this is what I love about this group is because when we think about civics and civic education, it's, it's a spectrum. And we talk about, you know, foundational documents and, and Christopher gets super nerded out about like parts of federalism and I do as well. And so does Emma and so does Darcy and so does um, David. And then we look at action civics and what we know great educators do is pull different pieces from all the areas. I like to obnoxiously call the National Constitution Center the keystone of that arch um, <laughs> of that. <laughs> We are Pennsylvania, so we've got to own it. Um, but we all work together to make a more robust student body, to make a more robust community body, adult body, parent body, all these pieces work together. And one of the key things that we do at the Constitution Center is we teach about that Constitution. We allow kids to start there in that foundation and the adults here, we want you to start in this foundation. So then you're able to see where the base is, where that, that foundation is for what you need to do. Because when we want the kids to keep moving and they go into the policy work of civic action and they're working with Darcy, come to Philadelphia, um, please do, <laughs> they can see the transparency of the system. And when you understand the system, when it's a transparent system for you and you know how federalism works, you know how the electoral college works, then you can make those policy action choices that are important and the correct ones. You can say, this, this is great the way it's working. It's working the way it should work. Leave it alone. 
this is solid, this is good. It's not, uh, it's when you know the knowledge, you believe in the system and you understand and you support that system. We know that through data and we wanna make sure our kids are well-rounded, robust, and they're able to do whatever actions they wanna take as citizens. So I can't thank this panel enough. It's super fun hanging out with you. Jeff was really sorry he had to jump off pretty quickly, but I was like, get that constitutional law in and then we're gonna keep going. So thank you so much, uh, Darcy Ritchie. Great to have you in the crew, new, uh, the newer one in the group, right? I think she beats you, Christopher, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah new. I'm pretty new. <laughs> you, you guys are neck and neck though. And Christopher Riano, it's great to have you. Emma Humphreys and David Bob, wonderful to have you all. So wonderful to have all of our Teachers Advisory Council, new council members and our board members on. And thank you so much to Madison, Sarah Harris and Jenna um, Karras, I almost said Winterly, old last name, um, from the National Constitution Center. Thank you all very much. We will send you a briefing document on this and we will send you the chat. So any last words from our team? Want to bring us home, um, Emma? <laughs> oh my goodness, folks, you are on, on the you. front line. Stay at it. Take good care of yourselves and be that place where your kids can talk about and nerd out with you. It's so important. Thank you all so much. Have a great night, everybody. And let's see if the election changed any. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody.